Hello, everybody. So to give everyone uh, a little incentive to pay attention, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, for those of you that tweet the most insightful lessons, <laughs> or frankly, the pictures that make us look coolest, you're going to uh, have a chance to win limited edition oxytocin molecule socks. So, so get on it. So I'm super excited for this panel, because um, one of the biggest myths uh, in deep tech uh, is that it necessarily means slow growth, slow iteration speed, uh, less revenue in the early days. Um, uh, and I, I wrote a blog post called Growing Fast with Atoms, which tried to dispel this, but I think nothing dispels this myth more than what Mark has been doing with Plasmid Source. Um, and so first, before we sort of dive into it, like what, what do you do at Plasmid Source? Is it some sort of like dinosaur as a service app? We're a, we're a dinosaur themed <laughs> DNA sequencing as a service company. So sequencing as a service, SaaS as we call it. Um, the core of any biotech is, uh, is biology, obviously. And the way that you interface with biology, the language of biology is DNA. So uh, if you're making new drugs, if you're doing ag work, if you're doing health stuff, if you're doing academic research, all of that requires constant uh, iteration on manipulating DNA and then reading that out. Um, and what that means is that anybody in biotech is spending a large part of their day manipulating DNA. And before they can proceed forward with their work, they need to know if those manipulations worked. So we go around to you know, all of their labs every night, uh, courier that into one of our facilities, um, and then get it on the sequencers, get them their data back so that when they show up the next morning, they know whether they can proceed forward with their research or they got to try again uh, to do what is their... And so contextualize, um, people that are developing new cures for cancer, new ways of diagnosing disease, new sustainable methods of bioproduction, you're sort of a core infrastructural piece in them being able to build what they build faster? Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you're working on a new cancer molecule, say, you want to start with some healthy cells and you want to give them a couple mutations that would make them cancerous, that way when you, you know, treat them with a drug to see if the drug works, you know, it's, if it kills off those cancerous cells that are otherwise identical to the healthy cells, you know you have a specific target. And that, again, requires manipulating the DNA of those cells. And that's true across sort of all of biotech from ag to basic research. And so just to contextualize it, I think it's always useful to sort of understand why, why pay attention to what this man is saying. Um, you know, you're, you're basically exactly three years into the company from founding. Give us some sense of the scale of the company. How many, how many customers? What's the revenue? What are the operations like around the world? Sure, yeah. So as, as Seth mentioned, we were founded in October of 2021. Um, so I was at Caltech. Um, and since then, we have grown to nine labs. So we just opened our ninth lab in Germany. Um, we'll be opening our 10th lab either later this year or at the beginning of next year. Uh, we have about 50,000 customers. Um, we are, you know, call it ARR, at about uh, over $40 million right now as of October, which was our three anniversary. Um, yeah, we have about 65 employees, you know, constantly hiring right now. Roughly how many Dropboxes? Uh, we have over 800 Dropboxes right now. So one of the things I love about Plasmid Source is oftentimes you will hear when someone says, tell me about uh, what you've achieved as a company, they'll lead off with a dollars raised, right? And you, you didn't hear him mention at all dollars raised as a company. These are all hard metrics in terms of improving customers' lives, in terms of generating revenue. Um, so you, you mentioned you have these sort of Dropboxes all around the world. Your people are physically putting their samples into a box, those are somehow getting from there to a lab, plasma source lab. That sounds like a really complicated logistical operation. Like, what, what exactly does that look like? It is a complicated logistical operation. Um, so when we started, I started out of Caltech uh, in LA and just, you know, really bootstrapped from there. So it was initially, I would take samples home at the end of the day to my garage where I'd work on them. And then essentially, as we made money, it was immediately build a logistics network coming up from San Diego, then immediately build a logistics network coming down from San Francisco. So we used to actually have couriers go around all throughout San Francisco, which was Berkeley, UCSF, Stanford. Every day, they would drive those to the airport. Uh, we would put them on a Southwest flight, fly it down to LA, have another courier go to the airport in LA, drive it into our lab, 
uh, get it onto our sequencers in the middle of the night so that people get their data in the morning, uh, and just continue to do that in, in Boston, in London, in Europe now, we, as we recently opened. We also um, have labs located near shipping hubs. So with UPS or FedEx or whatever these companies are, you can essentially co-locate a lab there and then get, get the samples into your lab in the middle of the night from pretty much anywhere in the country, which allows us to service uh, essentially the entire world at this point in, in overnight speeds. So one of the things I'm most impressed with is how efficiently you've managed to build out that like, fairly complex operation. So you know, it's three years in, you've grown to over 40 million annual run rate. Uh, you, you've raised only 1.2 million, and I believe you've never actually touched that money? Yeah, we never needed them. So the way we were able to do this is we saw a market need that we knew would be profitable very quickly, um, but we didn't know what we were doing. Right? I was just a, a technical person at Caltech, scientist, um, and didn't really know that much about starting a business. I'd grown up always wanting to start a business, but hadn't gone through the motions. So we did take a you know, million dollars essentially early on just to get in the ecosystem so that we can find out about events like this. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been fantastic. And you know, the, the core is just to be capital efficient, right? And, and the, the way you do that is by shipping, build and ship is essentially all you need to do when you start a company, right? Build and ship. Um, and you have to ship earlier than you think is reasonable because then you can, you know, our customers will tell you, oh, we, we think this is great, we think that's not great, as opposed to three years in, you find out you've been building the wrong product. So that's been core to our ethos is to, you know, ship immediately. Okay, so month one, you're literally like driving around collecting people's samples, bringing them to a shack in your backyard. In my garage, yeah. We used to, so I set up a bunch of draw boxes at Caltech um, and then UCLA, which, is, which was, you know, close enough that I could drive there after work. Um, and then, you know, just as soon as you're out of time, you know, you hire people to replace those things. I think for the first year, I worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty much. Um, and everybody was like, this isn't sustainable, you need to you know, slow things down, you need better work-life balance, and there's no way we would have been able to achieve what we did had I listened to that. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we absolutely, you know, okay, a day at the beginning was pick up samples, uh, go into my garage with my co-founders, do all the sample prep, uh, get stuff onto the machines, type some terminal commands to get the sequencers going, uh, go to bed at like midnight, go back out into the garage at 4 a.m., stop the sequencers, type some more terminal commands so that people will be able to start getting their data, get another couple hours of sleep, <laughs> then, then wake up and then go back to Caltech, where I was actually still work, had a day job, um, and then be doing essentially sales and tech support all day long. Okay, so what you just described, great for processing dozens of samples, but obviously would not work for the scale you're at now. So how did you go from that sort of very manual, you're doing everything yourself process, to what now is a fairly automated logistics network with you know, robotic robots in all the labs around the world? What were the first steps towards automating? The core ethos for everything we did was make this as replicable and automatable as possible, right? So like I said, when we first started, there was a lot of going out in the garage and typing in terminal commands. And then the mandate was essentially like the third or fourth time you do that, make it a button on the website that you have that's going to launch off an SSH command or something like that that will, you know, that anybody could do that's not me. Um, and everything needs to be um, uh, replicable in that. And so we control essentially everything through our internal website. Uh, we don't want any technician to have to know any, any special code. Um, heavily on automation. So uh, all of our processes, my background is in molecular biology and I'm, I'm you know, pretty proficient at all the molecular biology stuff. Uh, but the goal was to make it so that everything is as robust as possible, even if the yields are slightly worse, even if the speed is slightly worse, make it foolproof. And what that meant is then it was, it was super easy to automate. So, you know, at this point, I think my co-founder is as heavy into automation. He came from a lab automation background. And his sense, you know, leading the team is that we're probably the best in the world at sort of rapid iteration on automation like we do. So... And one of the things I love about how you are, if you go into a plasma source lab, you'll see a bunch of sort of robots that do liquid handling, but you'll also see a 3D printer. Um, and the idea for the 3D printer, if I'm not mistaken, is that any lab that figures out a better way of automating the process, um, say by adding in a new widget that they had to print out, can immediately send the design of that widget to every other lab around the world and the 3D printers get going printing it. How does that work? So 
Lab automation is inherently expensive. Typically, the machines cost about $200,000. Um, and they're, you know, they require an engineer to optimize them and, and to program them. Uh, we went totally in the opposite direction, got the cheapest robots we could get, which are OpenTrons robots. Um, and they were not supported with any of the sort of automation that we need. So as you mentioned, we got 3D printers where we print out our own labware that will slot in there. Um, and we actually make it so that it's actuatable. Um, and so you would think, like, say we need to move a tube around in the module. You would think maybe I'll put a little motor in there and engineer it in some way and, and control it through a, you know, the Arduino that's, or the Raspberry Pi that's controlling it. But we actually uh, make it actuatable with the actual robotic arm itself or the pipette. So we'll tell it to pipette on a spot, and that causes, say, a spring to actuate and, and do stuff. And it's all 3D printed, 3D printed springs, 3D printed uh, everything. We put magnets in those. Um, yeah, so that's made it like super easy. And as you said, what can happen is somebody you know, at our headquarters will design a new piece of labware uh, in the morning. And then at our nine labs, it'll print up on the 3D printer and all of those. And that evening will now be at scale with the next iteration. And that's, you know, that's like one day iteration on hardware around the globe, which is very, very difficult to do. Hmm. Um, but it, we're, you know, we're processing samples at such vo volume that it's very easy for us to start to see like, hey, this thing is working better than we expected, or this thing's not working as well expected, we need to go back. Um, but that's essentially one day iteration on hardware that's as it's deployed. Cool. Is it always from uh, HQ to the, the satellite labs, or does it sometimes fl flow the other way? So the people who are like really proficient at modeling the stuff and instantiating it are at HQ. Well, actually, they're not all HQ. They are distributed. Uh, but we, we only hire technicians. So we're so automated that we don't need many technicians. Um, we essentially can spin up a lab with one technician, um, and we can spin it up after about a week of getting the keys uh, to fully operational. Um, but we only hire people uh, with the idea that you have to be constantly giving us feedback. You have to be comfortable saying, you know, I have an idea of how to do this. Maybe it's dumb. Maybe it's not dumb. But you know, if they're not comfortable saying that, we will not hire them. Mm. So they may say, you know, I, I've noticed things. This is a slow step, or this is, looks at, like it fails a lot. Um, and then they'll communicate with an engineer and, and get it, you know, developed again within probably a couple hours. Mm. There'll be a prototype. So I think it's ironic in that, in, despite being profitable from, I mean, literally day one, you did not actually focus on margins or profitability in the early days. You were focused on sort of customer needs and, and nailing it as, as best as you could. Can you tell me a little bit about that philosophy? Yes. So our original product um, was, was whole plasmid sequencing. And the market for that, when we came in, was about, it cost about $500, $600 in a month to do that. Uh, we figured out we could do it you know, for, for very cheap and very quick um, and decided to go in at a $15 price point as opposed to something, you know, trying to undercut on just speed or just price. Um, and the idea there was that we will be sort of moving forward all of biotech by doing this. If everybody starts doing this as core to their daily life, you know, everything moves faster. Um, and so, uh, which, which was my mission. So, so before I'd started, I'd been very interested in building a therapeutics company, which is the normal way for somebody in my background you would go is, is build a new drug and then whatever, seven years later you find out if you're gonna pass the clinical trials or, or whatever that is. And then the exciting thing about that is you say, there's people that have this disease. If I cure a drug for that disease, now there's people that are going to be alive, right, based on my work. And that's like the best thing you can ask for as a scientist. Um, but what we saw is we could sort of step forward all of biotech broadly, right? So now we get, you know, drug companies will tell us, you sped this project forward six months, right? And that's now not a single product that we're working on. That's like, all of biotech, right? Um, and so that's super fulfilling. So our mission is to accelerate biotech. That is our core stated mission, is to accelerate biotech. And if we make products that enable that, people will use us, right? And if people are using us, you've got to be, there, there will be a way to make money off of that, right? Um, but no, the core focus has always been on delighting our customers, giving them exactly what they didn't know they wanted, mm. uh, but now like leapfrogs their research, and that continues, we continue to release product that is aligned with that. That approach reminds me a lot of, of sort of Jeff Bezos' approach at Amazon, right, where it's a sort of relentless focus on driving down costs, customer obsession, constant experimentation. Uh, they also run a you know, very logistics-heavy business. H have you taken any inspiration from the way Amazon's been run? <laughs> 
thinking about like how to start a company, like I said, my background was in science and engineering. Um, there is so much great knowledge in sort of biographies of people like Jeff Bezos and reading his shareholder letters or you know, any of these great entrepreneurs. There's, in my opinion, for anybody here who's, who's building a company, there's like Founders Podcast, which is incredible. And they just go through the biographies of all of these, these founders. Um, you read those biographies and you see it. And so certainly Be the Bezos model was something that heavily inspired us. And the idea there is that, you know, as long as we're getting customers, as long as we're shipping product, Every day we're learning. Every day we're iterating. Every day we're going to tweak things a little bit so that tomorrow they're going to be a little bit better, right? And that's that's very much aligned with how Amazon d does stuff. Um, so yeah, absolutely. So you you are a scientist. You are a sort of user of your own product, right? Yes. So in the very early days, it sort of was very obvious for you what to build. Right. But now you know there's big pharma companies using you. There's biologists that work in radically different fields. How do you make sure you're constantly closing that loop with the customers to make sure you're serving their needs? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, well, first of all, you have to hire very good people. And I would say setting a very high bar for talent, even if it feels like, how am I ever going to fill these positions? When you, do fill, when you do fill them, it's an incredible feeling, right? Like can, knowing that you don't have to worry about something is like the most valuable thing, as opposed to thinking you have to constantly double check somebody's work. Mm. Um, so, that's helpful, getting good scientists. Um, but the other thing is, it's just very hard for people to understand what is possible if you can make technical innovations. So like you said, um, I built a product that I needed, um, which was how we started. We're still doing that. But when I was initially pitching this to, to customers, so the way, the way this actually worked was um, I went around to whatever, all the, the big labs and UCSF and Berkeley and Caltech and UCLA. Um, and I walked around with like a basket of candy because like, it was COVID <laughs> times, so you couldn't get into the buildings. So I had like a giant basket of candy with our flyers taped to it and would just say like, hey, do you like, like candy? I'd say, yeah, and then so they let me into the building. standing outside the door yeah, with yeah, a bag exactly. of candy? Yeah, that's what I did, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but then I would go to the labs and I would say like, hey, we're going to do whole plasmid sequencing for you. And they were like, oh, like, I don't need that. I, the, the traditional mm. method was called Sanger sequencing. Um, and it's a sort of more limited scope. Um, and they say, oh, no, the Sanger sequencing, getting us everything we need, we wouldn't need whole plasmid sequencing. And if you, if you think about it, there's actually, there's tremendous benefit to doing whole plasmid, and it, the details don't matter here. But most labs would say, oh, we're cool. Like, we don't need this. Thank you. And then, like, the top labs, the mm. Nobel Prize winning labs, the Howard Hughes labs, they would, like, before I finished speaking, they'd be like, take my money, right? Like, when can we use you? And then everything flowed down from there. But most, most customers that benefited tremendously from this did not think they needed the product until they started using it. Um, and that's still how it is right now. We, we release, we continue to release product. And the way we do it now is we talk to customers. We say, what are your pain points? Um, what do you need? And they will never tell you what the actual thing is that you need, right? Mm -hmm. They'll think it's impossible. And then you can sort of, you know, figure out, oh, like, we could do it this way. Is that going to be helpful? Um, and the answer is usually yes. So, so that's difficult because you're basically... You, you're almost sort of saying that you know better than them, right? Because they're saying, I don't need that. You're saying, oh, you got to trust me. This would really accelerate your research. Um, how do you go about, once you, you, f you f really feel like you've nailed the product, actually communicating that to a customer? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so until the last couple of months, so like you said, we're three years in. Until the last couple of months, we didn't do any sales or marketing. Um, it was all word of mouth, mostly through Twitter. Um, and the way that worked was, like you said, every day the customers are going to our physical drop boxes, printing out a QR code, putting their DNA in there. And we put on the, on the order form, it said, feel free to draw a picture of a dinosaur on the back <laughs> of this. Uh, if our kids like it, you might win a prize, right? And so we host a weekly prize where uh, we, we put these dinosaur pictures. Um, and there's crazy engagement that we get with that. We have like literally thousands of dinosaur drawings that we've gotten from all of our customers. And I would guess tens of thousands. Uh, yeah, that sounds the right. The London yeah. lab had like a. a that sounds right. No, you can <laughs> cover the walls of every everything we have with them, and they're high quality drawn. Like a lot of them are are very good, um, but it's this this deep level of engagement. So um, you know, we are on Twitter or X or Blue Sky now or, or whatever <laughs> it is, constantly communicating with people, constantly saying like, you know, have you tried this? Um, and then you know, more recently, we do have a, a marketing team that will reach out, but. That is a very recent innovation for us. Um, and, it, and it wasn't really necessary. I mean, you make your product delightful enough and people will tell their friends about it. Okay, so you basically grew to 40 million run rate with no real sales and marketing team. Why, why build one? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, as, as companies mature, these things, you know, you, you get all the low hanging fruit at some point. Not everybody is online. Not everybody is willing to try something just because other people are trying it. And the other thing we've run into is, you know, we have deep penetration with academic labs, deep penetration with smaller biotech companies um, who are willing to try us. And, you know, the people that are starting biotech companies are coming out of the top labs. So, like, I think all of the Nobel Prize winning labs use us daily. Um, but those are the people that go out and they start a new company and then they'll use us. But they might go to a pharma company mm. and they'll say, hey, I want to use Plasmasaurus, it's so much faster. And the procurement cycle there is, is totally different. And that's not my background. That's not anyone in my company's background. So the pharma companies reach out and say, hey, we want to do a partnership agreement with you. We're like, we, we don't want to do, like, that sounds boring. We don't want to do that. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, it turns out you actually do need to have a sales marketing function to do those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were, at, you were at Caltech, as you mentioned, and your main research was on this sort of synthetic gene circuits for therapeutics. Um, normally, when someone goes from university to immediately starting a company, they are commercializing their own research. And so, you know, there's been a debate on Twitter recently arguing that, you know, too many people kind of go into their own research by default as their company. Um, I know at some point you were thinking that you might commercialize that. H how did that process unfold? Yeah, I mean, to that debate, the debate is, you know, should somebody who's been doing their PhD or their postdoc start a company specifically on that? And if you've just spent 10 years of your life working on a project, it's, it's like a sad realization that that's not where you're going to create value going forward, right? So I think that's why, it's the main reason people don't do that. Um, I think, you know, we're a, we're a tools company, right? We, we create, it's a service, but it's a tool for, to, to accelerate people's research. Um, I think that what anybody should be thinking about, right, is like what in the ideal world, how would this be done? And then how can I get closer to there, right? And maybe you have the expertise in that, maybe you don't, um, but like most stuff is not that hard if you just start doing it. Now the problem with something like a therapeutics company is again, it is very capital intensive. It's gonna be 10 years before you make any money on it. So it's inherently impossible to be making money on a, on a drug before it goes through the clinical trials and stuff. But I don't know, it's just be ambitious, I think is what it comes down to, right? Like actually be ambitious, actually believe you can do things that other people can't do. Because um, if you don't believe that, you're never gonna do it. Yeah, always more audacity. So I know there's probably a number of developers in the room. Uh, I run a deep tech VC firm and uh, developer, we back a lot of bio companies and developers often come up to me because they really want to accelerate the state of biology. But they say, man, but I, like, how can I contribute to that? Um, you have a pretty rock star uh, software team. Yeah. Um, wh what, what's their role? Yeah, so, so the interplay between traditionally like bioinformatics is maybe somebody who has... What is uh, bioinformatics? Bioinformatics is like if you're... Um, it's, there's a, bioinformatics would generally be you have all the data coming out of a bio, biological system and you need to make sense of it somehow, right? And so it's like stringing together different packages to do that. Um, we focused on really hiring top tier people, and a lot of those are just software engineers who don't really have a biology background. Ideally, they have a curiosity in biology. Um, you know, ideally, they're interested in biology. So one of the, the tests we have now in my company is we have a um, we had a, like an ant farm on the wall, the leaf cutter ants. Um, now it's a, now we have a termite farm, so it's like a <laughs> colony of termites, and we show it to the candidate and we say like, hey, what do you think of this termite farm? And if they're like, like whatever, like okay, this isn't going to work. But if they're interested in like, oh, there's the eggs, there's the queen, all that stuff, even if they're not a biologist, we know that mm. just by talking to biologists, they will be able to lever us up. Um, and so, yeah, I think so, like anybody with a software engineering background can definitely contribute. We are, I mean, the biggest limiter on our growth is talent, right? Like I said, you have to have a high bar for hiring. We need software engineers, we need computational biologists, we need wet lab engineers, all these things. Um, and, you know, they are building tools. We released, we released a new tool yesterday, actually, to everybody. Um, and the way we do it, we ship it, right? Like, we just built it and we shipped it, and now we're waiting for people to either start complaining about it or telling us how amazing it is. But we didn't do market research on mm -hmm. what people are gonna want. So. so you've been, it's just been incredibly fast out of the gate. Uh, what's next? What's next for Plasma Source? We currently do sequencing as a service uh, along many, many applications. I think, you know, five years from now, m pretty much anybody who's doing sequencing in biotech will, instead of planning the whole project out, instead of hiring their own, you know, data science team to do all these things, 
they'll just give us the preserved liver or whatever it is and get the answer back from us. That's where we're headed oh, for, for that. anything. In, that's that's in the sequencing cool. world. Final question. This is the most important one. Uh, Brontosaurus or Velociraptor? Brontosaurus. I like Brontosaurus because for a while it was considered like a fake dinosaur. Like uh, it got, <laughs> it was like the Pluto of dinosaurs where it got dethroned. Um, but as a kid, that's a, it's a very common one. But it, it's back. And so I never, just like I'm still calling it Twitter, I was happy to keep uh, sticking with Brontosaurus. Uh, and now it's a legit thing, Like many great founders, you know, it was doubted, but it was resilient, and it's, it's <laughs> undeniable now. All right, Brontosaurus. Everyone, thank, uh, thank Mark here. That was fun.